So kind of moving down the line here, as I said, animal bedding and construction materials are the biggest parts. Um, hempcrete is a, a huge thing right now. Um, what you'll find is that most of what is used for a lot of these materials is actually shipped in from overseas. Um, the market there, especially in Europe, has been um, exploding over the last 10 years. Uh, I was talking to a company um, a couple of weeks ago that buys um, overseas from Europe. They also have a processing facility there and they're running about eight to nine tons of material per hour. Um, and they are having trouble meeting their four to six week delivery window um, for a number of reasons, uh, shipping issues across the sea being one of them, um, but not having a large enough supply of domesticated product that they can work with is another. Um, so they're really trying to find a more domesticated supply because the, you know, the influx of what people are looking for in America is constantly and currently rising. Um, something that's actually not mentioned on here is cat litter, which, as I found out within the last two weeks, is an exploding market as well, um, because it has so many additional benefits that you don't see with your standardized litters. Um, so construction materials, as I was kind of alluding to, um, hempcrete being the biggest one, but you also have things like insulation bats, um, compressed flooring, which is, uh, there's a company in Tennessee called Hempwood, they do great work there um, to make actual hempwood flooring. Um, insulation bats are great. They're uh, flame resistant. I don't want to say they're they're not impenetrable, but you can go online and you can see plenty of people, you know, just with a blowtorch right to an insulation bat, and it it, you know, it's cured in a certain way and it's created a certain way. It's not like you're just taking a bunch of hemp right off the field and making insulation from it, um, but its ability to be fire resistant and also work um, for a lot of other little pieces from an antimicrobial piece. Um, a really amazing stuff that, you know, more research needs to be done on, but enough has been done where they are using it as a readily available um, construction material. Um, seed is really uh, a, a very broad subject. Um, we are not getting into seed just because of what it requires from a processing standpoint and what it asks from the farmers as far as from harvesting standpoint. Um, but, you know, these, the picture shown here is hauled hemp hearts. Um, I love them. They're delicious. They have a really nutty flavor. You can put them in smoothies. Um, people love toasted, um, just, you know, whole seed toasted or whole shell toasted um, hemp herd or hemp seed, pardon me. Um, but as they were kind of alluding to in some of the other meetings, that's kind of something that's on the fence right now. Some states have opened it up so you can use um, hemp seed as feed for animals. Um, so it's really a state by state basis, but it has a lot of uh, nutritional benefits that I think are going to bring it online as far as a um, supplemental feedstock for animals, supplementing out corn and other things that are really hollow in nutrition um, for something like hemp seed that has a really high nutritional value. Um, erosion control blankets. I've had a couple conversations with transit authorities that are looking to transfer over from their um, current plastic used erosion control blankets. They have problems with um, animals getting caught in them. You know, they don't degrade properly. So using industrial hemp, something that's renewable um, is a great solution for them. And if you think about, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles of millions of miles, I'd assume of um, roadways in America that have to be covered, um, not to mention roadways in other places that have to be covered, state highways and so on. Um, erosion control blankets are huge, but it's not one of those things. It's not, uh, as uh, Tyler said in the last, it's not a really a sexy thing people talk about. Um, but it is important. Um, rope is a one that's coming online. I mean, rope, people have been using hemp for rope since they sailed the seas the first time. Um, you know, coming over the Mayflower, a lot of that was made from industrial hemp. Um, the, you know, shipping boom in Boston, the reason people started growing industrial hemp and processing um, in Vermont and the, you know, the way they did was because of the sails and the ropes and the rigging that was made from industrial hemp um, from, you know, the ports in Boston. Um, wood materials, kind of getting away from the flooring, but mulch, fuel pellets, um, biochar fuel pellets are um, a little trickier because hemp herd has such a high ash content. Um, by comparison to your standard fuel pellets, it's about 2% as opposed to 0.2% uh, is what you're really looking for. Um, so you do have to use some kind of blend, but it is good as a supplement, supplementary material um, for fuel pellets and, you know, being in Vermont, um, we've switched over in my house to fuel pellets over the last couple of years. It's a lot easier than wood and it's a lot cheaper, pardon me, than oil, especially, um, considering oil prices now. So having that supplementation of something that's 
more renewable than wood overall, just because of the timeline for growing um, and something that can be used on a, on a readily available basis. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to do at Zion Growers. It's opening up that market for people to grow. And, you know, having an industrial hemp processing facility really makes it accessible as opposed to trying to do it, you know, as one offs on your farm. It can be done, it is, but it is difficult. And there's only so many uh, markets you can really break into depending on kind of the outputs you're getting. Um, bioplastics are a little further out. It requires micronized material, and that's basically taking your hemp herd and pulverizing it all the way down to dust. Um, there's very specific particulate um, metrics that I, I, I won't get into because it's, it's really um, in-depth stuff that even I'm still learning myself. Um, but it is something that many car companies are doing. Um, Mercedes and Lotus, these two models listed here, they actually use about 20 kilograms a piece per car of industrial hemp plastics and bioplastics. And you can see here a composite um, shown right here that's actually made from uh, bioplastics from industrial hemp that's used for um, your cars. Uh, the other one that I found that was interesting was this right here. It looks like compressed fiberboard, but it's actually used for um, sound remediation or sound dampening um, within homes. So all of these things can be made from industrial hemp. And obviously there's a bunch of others, but you, know, you could say that anything you can make from plastic or anything you can make from wood, um, there's a way to make it from industrial hemp herd is really the easiest way to look at it. Um, so moving forward, this is our facility. Um, kind of an older picture is here when it was kind of in its heyday. And then this is a picture I've taken myself more recently over the last couple of years. Um, it's an old grain facility. And as you can see, they used to do lime and salt here, um, owned by the Eid Corporation. Um, they used to do work with Blue Seal as well. Um, as you can kind of see their old faded picture here is no longer in use for these things. Um, but our ideal is to take this section of the building here and renovate it to um, have the upper floor as storage. And then the first floor will be our processing um, in the future, hopefully, potentially moving into this building, but the uh, construction concerns and constraints there um, kind of limit our ability. Another thing we're really excited about is the ability to use rail um, to move and transport some of these things um, as far as our offshoots and even bringing bales in, because you know the whole point of this is to be green and renewable and you wanna make a lower carbon footprint. And the ability to use rail, considering where we're located and that rail spur is still standing, um, our ability to use that to transport goods across the state and outside the state. Um, and a couple conversations I've had with the rail companies in Vermont um, has been really exciting. And to see rail be used in the state for these needs um, to kind of lower the overall carbon footprint and make it make more sense are really important. Um, so our processing system, uh, this is the fiber track 660, fiber track 660 mouthful there, apologize. Um, but it's an entire processing system that allows us to size herd, um, separate the herd and the fiber to about a 2% separation. Um, and it allows us to hit those specs that I was talking about, um, whether it be for one inch or all the way down to less than a quarter of an inch. Um, we won't be doing any micronizing here because I haven't been able to um, establish a market for it. Um, people I've spoken to have said, you know, they've had a great success with it. Um, but it's just not something we are getting into right now. The additional piece of equipment, because this is a modular system, you don't have to get everything with it. So um, what gets us to that micronized product is an additional hammer mill stage at the end. So there's a initial hammer mill stage that allows us to size everything. And then there's a stage beyond that that gets you that really small particulate micronized uh, material that you're looking for for those bioplastics. Um, but the way the system lays out is you'll see right here at the front, you have um, your bale unroller. This takes large round bales. You know, you can do with your standard John Deere the same way you do with hay. And then it makes its way through the system. Um, there's an undulator, what is also known as a shaker table that starts your separation. And then the rest of the system is built to do that continuous separation. Um, the fiber side is a little um, smaller, um, so it doesn't need as much work to really remove the herd. And then the herd that has been removed from the fiber actually goes back into the other side of the system to then be resized. Um, and you can, it's basically switching out screens and that's what really allows you to size out the herd to whatever specs you want. So, you know, we are able to really meet whatever market demand and whatever market need there is based on what we're able to do with the system. Um, there are other systems available. Um, 
there are larger ones and it's really whatever you want to spend. You, you could spend, you know, half a billion dollars on an entire plant. Um, this system is a little more functional. It's under a million dollars. Um, but this is based off the decortication technology that separates herd from fiber using um, two roller bars that basically intertwine and kind of in the pictures in the last presentation were shown there. Um, it's basically a larger version of that. Um, something that I've recently uh, tried to get on board with is a, um, a sonic, it's essentially a sonic wave form of separation that doesn't require as much energy or maceration of the material. Um, there are a lot of companies that are coming online and trying to use it. it it's still um, kind of in the R&D stages in some places, but it's a really exciting piece of equipment and machinery and an idea um, that would allow less use of overall energy needs and get a cleaner product that hasn't been you know, mangled as much as you kind of put it through rollers and really put the material through its paces. Um, so that kind of lays out everything as far as the fiber tract. Um, the company that makes it is Formation Ag. They're out of Colorado. Um, they've been at this the last five or six years. Um, this is their most recent model, and they are always kind of updating and, you know, uh, reimagining the process as they learn more. Um, so it's, you know, it's an evolving system, as are most things you'll find in the uh, marketplace right now. Um, so growing for industrial. Um, so, you know, the last presentation was great. It explained a lot of what um, kind of what I'm going to cover here. Oh, go back. Um, obviously, it's it's a little different giving um, Vermont and uh, North Carolina, um, but it kind of from a base standpoint, um, something I really found interesting was getting in planting. And that's over the last couple months, something that I've come to understand is getting this in, um, getting your seed in as soon as possible. Um, for us, we're looking at an early May um, to really get in and start planting because it's, it's what's necessary to make sure that it makes sense. Um, because you really want as much time, uh, uh, someone who's been a great mentor to me, Eric Singler over at International Hemp, um, was that you really want a good 45 days before the summer solstice. So getting your plants in as early as possible um, is really is what required. I'll, I'll kind of dig into some of these pieces here. So for your soil needs, um, you can really look at it in the same way you look at corn, you need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, the levels can, you know, vary and when nutrient prices going up, it's a lot harder to say, you know, what makes sense for people, but manure spreading works. Um, it, it works just fine. It is a weed, as they say, so it does grow under harsher conditions. Um, but, you know, given you want an ideal stand, ideally you want to set, test your soil, kind of find out what your needs are and supplement as needed. Um, equipment needs, as um, we're kind of covered before, but you're looking at... Um, a uh, seed planter, obviously you need tilled, plowed ground, seed planter um, for obviously for your planting. A bush hog is recommended for weed management towards the end of season, um, a sickle bar mower for harvesting, and then some kind of um, hay rake that allows you to turn your material during the redding process that takes place after the actual harvest and the actual cutting in the field. Um, as you can see here, you know, seed selection for us has been, um, we've been working with International Hemp. They've been great. Um, they have a uh, provider here, Kings Agro Seed, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, and they've been working, we are looking at a Hanola and a Bio Lebrowski for what we want to grow here. Um, UVM um, has done testing data on both of these. So there is kind of a one for one that makes it a little easier to understand. And some of the data that backs up, you know, that this is something that can work here. Um, the weed remediation, as I was saying, uh, for a bush hog, um, that's really recommended towards the end of the season from some of the people across the country I've talked to is to expect the outside of your crop, crop to kind of grow up with weeds. You know, from the herbicide and pesticide standpoint, it's really hard because there's not a lot of organics out there. So expecting a good four or five feet of your crop to grow up on the outside, to till that under essentially, expecting that loss, but it creates a buffer zone for the interior of your crop, making it a little easier to manage. They just rototill that under, and then that also gives you a starting point for your sickle bar mower when you want to start your harvest. Um, after you're actually doing your sickle bar mowing, the redding process, um, this is what I will say is probably the most volatile point of this whole process. And it also speaks to why you need to get this crop in as soon as possible. 
Um, for those who are familiar with Vermont, obviously we do get heavier rains towards the middle to late fall. Um, the redding process is essentially a controlled rotting process where the rain, um, light rains, heavy fogs, dews, um, in combination with high heat days, you know, the hotter days of the summer um, or late summer, I should say, really start to break down the natural glues that hold the fiber to the stock in the herd. Um, that redding process can take anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, and it requires using your hay rake to turn that material over so you get an even cure or dry um, on your material. You want you know, a, a yellow hayish color um, kind of when you're harvesting. And then after that process, you want to bale it in your standard round baler. Um, and that's as we, uh, kind of what I spoke on before, what we take, um, what we'll be taking out our facility. Um, the redding process, as I said, is the most volatile real part of this whole process. Um, getting things in before those heavy rains, you do not want torrential downpours. You don't want those late have fall heavy rains that'll really over ret and just rot out your material. So avoiding that at all costs is really what we want to get to. So, you know, for the growing window, if you're looking at anywhere, you know, from 110 days to 90 days, somewhere in there, um, because we're not harvesting for grain, we can actually harvest a little earlier. So it makes it a little easier. Um, but looking at it from that perspective, you really want to plant early, harvest as early as possible, and then ret for those two, three weeks when you have a decent um, climate. And as many farms have told me, that is, that is a difficulty that concerns them. It is a concern, um, but the timing of everything and knowing kind of what that looks like is why it's so important to get in early, know what the, you know, keep an eye on the weather and really make sure you know what's um, kind of what's coming and what's going to happen over that reading period. Uh, for storage, it's a little complicated. Um, for, the, for the round baling, you really don't want to plastic wrap any of this. You want either mesh wrap or twine bales. Um, those are both ideal. Uh, we are able to store a certain amount on our property, um, but you know, you get into the hundreds of acres, you're talking about uh, an Amazon size warehouse of what you would really need to do hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, so for storage, you know, I would recommend away from any pooling areas um, on your land where water might come even from, you know, a drier day, anywhere it really pools. Um, coverage is best, even a tarp, something to keep any additional rain from really falling on it. Um, ideally, you want to keep it by a tree line on a hill somewhere you can soar away from all of that. Um, bailing, as I said, you know, plastic wrap is not, you don't want to do that. You don't want that, um, the degrading process to continue. You want to stop it. Ideally, you want to be bailing this at below 20% uh, moisture content for your bales. It makes it easier for us on the processing side to honestly have it at 15% or less, but understanding weather conditions, that can be hard. Um, from a shipping standpoint, uh, we've been in touch with uh, Quest Transportation. They've been great at kind of laying out how this might work for us um, and for farmers in general for shipping needs. It kind of works the same way for Christmas trees. You know, during a certain time of the season, they basically have someone who will go out and do a you know, eight hour shift, run as many lines or back and forth as you need. Um, and that will cover you. It's about $1,200, I think, was the high end to get you really anywhere in the state. Um, but that really covers as far as a flatbed truck. You're talking about um, you know, 40,000 pounds um, of loadable material. Um, and they've been great about assisting us with the logistical piece of that, as well as on the back end for what we're looking at doing um, for shipping needs of post-process material. Um, this is kind of a very generalized breakdown of costs. Um, the gas here, I put it five gallons. I'm probably already wrong about that, the way gas prices have been going. Um, and some people have told me, you know, $16 an hour, they're paying farmhands more than that. But you're looking at an average cost of about 540 per acre. Um, for our seeding needs, we're looking at about 45 to 50 pounds, which is, you know, considered the standard. Um, seeding heavier is recommended in some situations. But if you're trying to get a, a general average, about 45, 50 pounds is right. Um, at about 350 per pound, it's about 175 bucks for a 50 pound bag of seed. We have the numbers here for 45. Um, that's why it's at 158 as opposed to 175. Um, but you can kind of see the, the general breakdown. Um, the nutrient values are based off corn. So that's why it puts it at about 190 per acre. Um, so you're looking at about a 504 per acre cost. Um, with the way we're working things, um, we are 
paying at about 14 cents per pound, which puts the payout um, at about 840 bucks per acre. That's at a 6,000 pounds of material per acre, which um, as you'll kind of see here from some of the other presentations is a pretty conservative number. Um, so we're pretty, you know, based on what everyone else is seeing for averages and on some of the testing data UVM has done um, and that we are extremely grateful for because it makes, you know, explaining a lot of these things a lot easier. Um, looking at 6,000 pounds, that's a pretty conservative number to, so to say, $840 an acre. So if you hit, say, closer to 8,000 pounds per acre, you're looking at somewhere closer in the neighborhood of $1,000 per acre. Um, gross. Beyond that, that's really most of what I want to get into here. And obviously, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, but this is my contact info right here. Um, you can find us on our website. Um, there's a presentation I did for farmers uh, about two weeks ago um, that's listed there. It's all on YouTube. Um, and you can find links for all that available there. Great. Thank you so much, Travis. Should I um, leave this up or do you want me to stop screen sharing? Um, you can leave it up for a minute or two so people can take your info down and then I'll take over and share the CCA credit in a minute. So same as before, if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we can ask them to Travis live. It looks like we have one question already. The question is, are you accepting investors? And if so, what would be a minimum investment amount? Um, we are accepting investors. Um, I wouldn't say there's a minimum amount. We've actually been working with, um, we were fortunate enough to take part in uh, Launch Vermont or Launch VT um, last year. And uh, a gentleman that was running the program at the time has put us in touch with um, a group that basically bundles investments, smaller investments, um, to make it a little easier on our cap. To, uh, it, it's kind of a complicated financial system that I, I don't fully understand. Um, but the way it works, because the way the investing works, the, the more investors you get in the pot, the, the harder it is. So it basically takes a lot of smaller investments and compiles them together into one larger investment. Um, so it can actually take a, your cap hit of how many investors you have actually lessens overall. Um, but it still allows all of those investors kind of the same input as they would have if they invested directly. Um, so I really, there is no minimum. Um, obviously, you know, we are doing a lot of this ourselves. There's a lot of grant money we've gotten. Um, the picture actually you see here at the end of the presentation is from um, a tax credit award we got from the state. It was uh, $165,000 for downtown tax credits. Um, but we are, you know, we're always looking for more investment. You know, I'm, I'm not a millionaire. I say that up front. So a lot of this work I've done is from my own savings, um, investment from people I know, my family, um, and some larger investors, but we are, we are definitely looking um, for more investment. So if uh, you have interest, feel free to reach out and we can kind of uh, talk that out, what that might look like. Great. Um, the next question we have is, when will you be running and able to take in raw material? Um, we are looking to be up and running uh, for this season. We are um, still looking for additional acreage. We're looking to get at about 750 acres for the season. Um, but our actual ability to take material would be closer to fall of this year. Um, we'll be breaking ground on the facility. And I know it's a, technically a built facility, but there is a lot of um, work that needs to be done. The campus is about 100 years old. So some of the buildings have to get um, brought down and there has to be some revamping and gutting of the insides. So I would say at earliest, we're looking at, you know, a September timeframe before when we're going to start processing, I would say as early as, you know, August, we could start accepting material. It's exciting coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's coming up quicker every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of on a similar thread, someone was asking, are you developing contracts with farmers? Uh, yes, we are. We are looking to contract with farmers. Um, the contracting will kind of work a little differently from this year to next year. Our ideal um, contract would allow us to pay farmers up front, um, at least upon delivery, as opposed to uh, waiting for us to process material, sell it, and then pay back the farmers from what we make. Um, so this year, it would require us to process and then sell the material and then pay the farmers. 
Um, so the contracting will little, look a little different from this year to um, the you know, following years. Um, but we are looking to establish contracts with farmers as far as you know, the, that entails what they'll be growing, the, um, you know, when they'll need to be planting, what the material will be accepting look like, and a, you know, a bunch of little other pieces um, that make sense for farmers and make it make sense for us. And that, you know, we obviously we want to take care of farmers because without farmers, we can't do, I, I have no business without farmers. I can't process anything without farmers. So um, taking care of farmers is, is really um, paramount for what we're looking to do. Great. And I think following up on that, um, they're wondering, so farmers buy their own seed, but you're setting what variety they will use. Is that correct? Yes. And that's really to get um, to hom homogenize the process. So we know exactly what we're getting in. We have better idea of how it's going to grow and we, we can have some kind of expectation um, as far as moving forward, what that will look like. Um, we are in the, you know, we, we are open to if people want to bring us material just to process for them and pay us for it and have a return, you know, we are open to that. Um, but our business model is based on what we saw the issue within CBD is that farmers were being asked to grow something and then pay someone to process that into tinctures and then take it back and then try and resell it again. So the idea was, is that we would just buy the material and we will handle everything from that point on. The secondary market, the processing, and make sure that you know farmers are taken care of, and they're not asked to do an entire separate business on top of what you know normal farming requires. Which anybody will tell you is uh, is in a whole day every day in itself. So it you know trying to take that off their plates and put that on ours um, is really what we want to do. Great. Another question we have is: Do you have any contacts with European partners? farmers, processors, et cetera? Um, I have spoken to some people um, as far as partners no, because they all export into America. Um, it's, you know, from what I've gathered, France has like the gold standard. They export their herd. It's what everybody wants. It's used for some of the, the best animal bedding in the world. You're talking about, you know, championship racing stallions or they bed their animals on industrial hemp herd. You don't, you'll have to believe me. You can look it up. I didn't believe it when I first heard it, but it, there's so many benefits to it that it just makes sense. Um, it doesn't have to be as expensive as they pay for. As I found out, there's, there's quite a uh, price uptick, but you know, you can, if you do, if you love YouTube for a lot of stuff, you can go on YouTube and find plenty of people using it, um, doing plenty of comparisons side by side, explaining all of the benefits they found, you know, for, for animals, for um, horse stalls, they're mucking less. Um, they're using less material. It's more absorbent. Um, it's, you know, it helps with ammonia smells. It also, um, when you put it into your manure piles, it actually degrades a lot faster than your standard wood chips. So instead of waiting a whole year to be able to use that manure, you can actually use it a lot sooner because the material you're bedding your animals with degrades so much quicker. Um, so Europe really isn't accessible to us because we are just so far behind. Um, just from a, you know, we, we started in 2018, if you want to look at it that way. Um, so really we're trying to keep up with them and trying to catch up to really supplement that, you know, imported supply from what everyone else is getting everywhere else and really start the domestic demand um, and fill that hole that's there. As I said, you know, they're, they're processing that, like I said, the company I spoke to, they're doing like eight to nine tons per hour with their machinery and they're, you know, exporting tons of material, but they can't meet the demand because of the shipping needs and the shipping timeline. So it makes it a lot easier if they can just say, hey, Travis in Vermont, we need this to, you know, somewhere in Colorado or we need it down to Tennessee or wherever you're looking to send it. It's, it, it makes the whole process and the supply chain a lot smoother for them. Great, um, the last question that I see in the chat now, um, is in the new USDA program, are there any interstate limitations with transporting fiber hemp, like possibly other hemp, either processed or unprocessed? Sure. Um, the realistic answer is no. Um, when you're talking about moving material, interstate material, obviously, you know, in the long run, you don't want to be processing material outside from, you know, you don't want to be bringing stuff in from Maine to be processed in Vermont. It just doesn't make much sense. You're, you're really 
not doing service to the whole point of this, you know, a smaller carbon footprint is the whole point. And if you're shipping things in from all over the place, um, someone I spoke to put it to me best. They're like, at one point, there's going to be a processing facility or multiple in every state to make this make sense, which is totally reasonable. Um, but as far as shipping, you know, what you're really shipping is material that's been left in the field to ret. Um, so the amount of THC or CBD content is almost negligible, if non-existent for a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, in the field, growing green is one thing, but after you go through the redding process where a lot of that stuff has been broken down, um, especially after it's been processed, but even before when you're bailing, um, it's not really an issue because any testing that could be done, it, it acts and looks and smells in much a similar way to hay. Um, so, you know, if you get pulled over, it's not like you're getting pulled over with a bunch of bales of, you know, round green CBD or anything like that. And when we're doing post-process material, it's like we're sending out, you know, wood chips. So there, there's really no concern as far as from an industrial hemp standpoint um, for post-process material and the kind of shipping we'll be doing. All right. Um, we have one minute left and a couple of questions. I'm thinking we might have time for one of them. Um, is there any use or market for the fiber waste, um, like plant stocks from CBD crops? Um, well, that's yes and no. The easiest one is um, people are sometimes mulching them for animal bedding for like cows and stuff like that. Um, the quality isn't as high and the separation is a little more difficult because you're working with more stems, uh, more branches off the main stock. Uh, so there is potential there. It's just not something anyone's really dug into or tackled beyond just mulching the entire plant and using that for, um, say, like cows um, or cattle in general. All right. Well, thank you so much, Travis. That, that was a great presentation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure others did too. Um, and it is time to move on to session three of our track. Session three is titled Clothing is Agriculture, UVM Extension, Northwest Crops and Soils, Hemp Fiber Trials. Our speakers are Heather Darby and Laura Sullivan. Dr. Heather Darby is an agronomist with UVM Extension. Heather developed the UVM Hemp Program in 2015. She has conducted research on industrial hemp, including projects to identify best management practices for grain, fiber and flower production. Heather has also developed the first undergraduate hemp course for the UVM Plant and Soil Science Department. Laura Sullivan is a fiber artist and farmer working intimately on the UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soil Programs Hemp Fiber Research Trials at Borderview Research Farm in Alberg, Vermont. With a goal of reviving local fiber sheds in the Northeast, Laura is deeply interested in disrupting our runaway carbon emissions trajectory through a closed loop textile market where farmers are paid a premium for their raw materials grown with environmental integrity. This presentation will discuss the current state of the global fashion um, industry and alternative possibilities of a circular soil derived textile industry where textiles could sink carbon back into the ground at the end of their lifespan as nature intended. They will discuss results from the fiber trials at Borderview Research Farm in Alberg, Vermont. So Laura and Heather, I will let you take it away. Did you, did you wanna start or do you want me to just talk a little bit about agronomy and then just, I can give you the rest of the time? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me do that quick. And I, I wanna make sure that Laura has plenty of time to share everything she's been working on. But um, <clears throat> uh, just continuing on a little bit about what Travis and Tyler were talking about, I could just share some of the yields um, <clears throat> and production considerations for growing hemp here in, in Vermont. And we have been looking at fiber since 2017. Um, and these are the average yields that we have seen. And so this is across a number of varieties and each year is different. Um, and, and oftentimes the varieties were different as well. 
And, you know, you can see 2017 had this eight ton, eight ton of dry matter yield per acre, which I want to say was unrealistic, but it's not actually unrealistic. Um, it is an attainable goal and yield. Um, but more often, we see yields down here in the average kind of three, three to four tons of dry matter per acre. And, you know, why that huge difference? Uh, it really has a lot to do with the varieties that are selected, but also has a lot to do with the density of the stand and how well the stand grows in any particular year. And I will say in the years 2016 and 2017, we had something that's called beginner's luck. I think, <laughs> and it really didn't deter us at that time from growing hemp at all. But the reality is that um, it is a little bit difficult or can be challenging to grow a, a really high yielding stand of fiber and or grain. And you can see that here in this data. Um, I know Laura's gonna talk a lot about the BAST and, and herd fibers and what she's been doing, but just to show you the range um, of the percent bat, it says bass, that's funny, bass fiber that we've seen again, this is all across lots of different varieties. Um, and I will say, you know, as time is going on, we're starting to be able to obtain more varieties and figure out what varieties are really best for um, hemp fiber explicit <laughs> um, purposes, right? Most of the varieties we've had available to us are dual purpose. Um, and that means they're being grown for grain and fiber usually, and actually generally the same crop in one year. So, you know, they're not out there to generally maximize fiber yields or grain yields. It's a compromise between both. So I'm just showing you some variety trial results, and these are all available on our website. So you can, you know, go over the, re the reports in detail. This is from 2020. And Tyler said this, you know, people hear about these 10 foot tall hemp crops. Um, <clears throat> and we did see that in our first years of growing hemp. Um, I don't know if they were, yeah, they might've been 10 feet, but uh, this was in 2020 and we had a drought um, and the hemp really didn't get very tall at all. And you can see it was about four feet tall at the height, at the highest height. And the height obviously impacts yield. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Travis mentioned planning earlier and that definitely is a goal. Um, but even then there's a lot of environmental factors that can influence the overall height of the hemp. So, you know, this is what we saw in 2020. This is what we saw in 2021, where we saw the tallest variety being about seven feet tall and you can see the span of yields across all those varieties with our highest yielding crop being Futura, um, which I, I think um, Tyler said was also his favorite. It's one of ours to producing, you know, almost close to seven tons of dry matter. So again, getting, getting right up there in production. Um, I will say, I think our yields could be better and could reach that eight tons if we can get the stands to be thicker and that's been a real challenge for us. But again, all of this data online with the heights and stem diameters, all, all those components um, listed there. All right, so um, dry soils, I don't wanna say dry soil, I take that back. Well-drained soils are really important to uh, good productivity. You know, really heavy, wet, saturated soils are gonna make it a challenge for establishment planting date, as Travis said, we're looking at May and you can plant into mid-June, but ideally, you know, getting the most out of that vegetative growth stage is what you're after. So you want to plant when the, you know, soil is ready, the temperatures um, are in that ideal range, you know, soil temperatures around 50 degrees. So you don't want to rush it into the ground. You do have kind of some time basically to plant. Um, and it's not a huge, huge rush in the spring like some crops. 
you know, a seating depth of around an inch is good. You know, you really want it where the moisture is. We have had dry springs the last few years. Um, but, but most importantly, I think is thinking about the seeding rate and Tyler brought this up. And the reason I wanna mention this is because I've said the challenge that we're really having is in getting, getting that ideal stand. And I think, what did Tyler say, Laura? Like 20, 20 to 30 plants per square meter or square foot. I don't remember what, what he said, um, which sounds about right to me. But, you know, when you look at um, sheets, varietal sheets, um, and recommended seeding rates, it's going to say for fiber, you know, 50 to 55 pounds of seed per acre. Well, that doesn't include uh, the germ rate. And also, you should be planning on a 30% mortality loss right out of the starting gate. So if you have a germination rate on that seed tag that's 80%, which is what we commonly see, and you're planning for a 30% mortality loss, you're almost needing to double your seeding rate to overcome that. And this is a reality. Um, and Tyler mentioned this as well, that he's hearing from the seed industry or consultants that the recommended rates are being pushed up. And it's because of the reality of it's difficult to get a really full stand. Um, and so seeding rates are actually ranging between 65 and 85 pounds of seed per acre. And then again, this makes the cost of seeding go up. Um, and, you know, we've been growing hemp for four or five years. And this, I would say, is our primary challenge. Um, the tools that you use to seed with are really important. Uh, and I say that because if you have a seeder, a drill, and it's crushing the seed either through vacuum pressure um, or the metering uh, reels that turn the seed out of the drill, uh, that's again, part of your mortality loss because you're crushing your seed. So there's a lot of pieces to pay attention to, especially right at the beginning of the season um, to make sure that you get a good stand. And this is what we see, you know, we see these thin stands um, and trying to overcome that We've been working on, you know, over time, bumping up the seeding rates, looking at the grain drills, but probably most importantly, thinking about the condition of the soil. The soil condition, and here you can see it's not that great. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a little crusted. Hemp seedlings trying to get out of the ground, you know, they're not that strong. And you can see where the seed's actually coming up in these cracks, right? So if you have any crusting after you plant, you get a heavy rainstorm and you have poor soil quality, it's really gonna impact the germination of that seed and its ability to get out of the ground, right? So these are all the things that you need to pay attention to so that you get that really thick stand and you get high fiber yields or grain yields, but you also don't have the weed pressure. Um, and weed pressure can ruin, can ruin your stand. It can ruin the quality of the grain and also, ruin the quality of the hemp fiber that's there. Um, as far as water goes, you know, most people are not irrigating uh, hemp for grain or fiber, but I will say that some folks have moved to watering the hemp up, uh, especially on really dry soils or in dry years. And for most people, that's not um, an option. But again, making sure that there's plentiful moisture uh, when you're seeding is a really good idea to get the seed up and out of the ground as quickly as possible. And then I'll just end on fertility and turn it over to Laura. But um, there's a lot to think about here. And, you know, the recommendations for hemp are somewhat similar to corn. Um, not exact, but it is a good ballpark, as Travis said. Um, you know, hemp does not use as much phosphorus as corn does, actually, and you should really pay attention to your soil tests to, um, to get potassium, phosphorus, and liming recommendations. As far as nitrogen goes, um, you know, on average, we see the hemp that's planted into a low nitrogen, uh, residual nitrogen field, so that would be a field that hasn't had long-term manure application, or maybe it's a light textured field, really will need <clears throat> that 100 up to maybe 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre 
you know, added in some form or the other. But in our our research trials, we have not seen this at all. Um, and we've added rates ranging from nothing all the way up to 200 pounds and not seen yield response. So you wanna be careful here. You don't wanna just go out and add nitrogen. Um, you really need to look at the soil test, what you've done in the past, if you're gonna add manure. Uh, there's a lot of pieces to pay attention to here, especially given the price of fertilizer right now being very, very expensive. Um, so you wanna use what's in the soil and what you have available on your farm before you go out and spend money on fertilizer because it will reduce you know, profits one way or the other. So I'll end on that and um, we have lots of research on our website and uh, I wanna give Laura time to talk about everything she's been doing. Go Laura. Hi everyone, um, I'm Laura. I've been on um, Heather's extension team for just about a year now. Um, this PowerPoint is like a visual storytelling of what's been happening in our fiber trials. Um, and um, thank you for everyone who's still on this call because I know it's been a long day. Um, but I hope this PowerPoint helps us all imagine what's possible for textiles in the US going forward. So um, growing fiber begins before planting. Um, as Heather mentioned with seeding rates and everything and like a lot of good stories, um, it begins with a seed. So on the right side, you can see the Petri dish there. That's us testing for germination rates um, so that we can plant accordingly. We were aiming for about um, 40 stocks per square foot live seed, but um, I think next year we'll plan on upping that. Um, here you see our trials when they were young. Um, so we trialed 13 varieties, um, four reps per variety in five foot by 20 foot plots. Um, and they were planted on June 8th this year. Um, after some time they grew up and this was probably just before harvesting because it uh, looks like we're a little late on the flowering piece there. Um, but you can see, yeah, they definitely, they definitely grew, which was <laughs> what we needed to happen. Um, so then we have harvest. Um, we harvested on August 16th and 17th. Um, and uh, I'll just say, take note of how the plants are um, laying there after harvest, because that's a piece of field reading, which a few people have touched on already. Um, so the redding process, we trialed some water redding and field redding. Um, you can see this pool was used for the water redding. The other video is um, the field redded hemp needs to be flipped every few days. So um, there was a big learning curve with redding for us. And it's something that varies from year to year. Um, depending on what the weather's doing because redding is um, dependent on moisture and microbes. Um, and I think as Travis mentioned, it's the process of breaking down the pectin and lignin that binds the bass fiber to the herd fiber. Um, and next year we hope to incorporate potentially a third redding method, which will be called enzymatic redding. So here's our water redding um, pool. And you can see on the first day, the water was really clear and um, we just kind of threw a bunch of heavy objects in there to hold it down. So it was all submerged. And then a few days in, it gets this really like gnarly film on it and it smelled really bad. <laughs> like everybody on the team uh, can attest to that. Um, and some of the pros of water redding are that it's a more controlled environment because everything's submerged below the surface. So um, it's going to ret more evenly than leaving it out in the fields um, vulnerable to the elements. But um, a con of water redding is that there's a high, high environmental cost due to water use and um, there's a high oxygen demand for the wastewater because it's getting all, it's very active. So um, it's maybe not the best practice for a large scale. 
Um, here's our field reading, some of our field reading specimens. Um, and yeah, like I said, there was a bit of a learning curve with this. It was kind of a guessing game and doing a lot of research online and figuring out, like just getting a feel for it is really what it is because it definitely varies um, every season depending on what the weather is doing. Um, with field reading, you have less control than in water reading. Um, you're gonna need moisture, but not too much. And like the other side showed, um, it has to be turned. I think for us, it was like about every six days um, and it smells a lot better <laughs> than, than water reading. Um, so here is where it starts to be turned into, um, into yarn. And um, I have to mention the old Stonehouse Museum in Brownington because they let us borrow some uh, antique or antique replica, replicas of some flax processing um, equipment. So this is called a flax break. And um, you can see underneath the fiber there, it's like making a pile of herd. I have a better video of that later. Um, I really love this photo because I think it shows the moment where the material goes from like plant matter to something different. It's like kind of right in the middle there. Um, so that's why I chose to include this one. And here's like the majority of the processing. <laughs> um, and yeah, just notice that pile of herd that, that um, happens underneath the break there. Um, and that's called a hackle, that piece. So sliver is like a plant word for roving. Um, it's a strip of loose, untwisted textile fibers produced by carding. Um, and this is the raw material that um, becomes yarn. Um, so this is a slide where we can imagine clothing that biodegrades into nutrients and not pollutants. Um, nature has 4 billion years on us of tried and true testing. Um, and we should dress to divest whenever we can. Um, this is me um, melting snow to boil the fiber. Um, I did a lot of tests with seeing what would happen if it was boiled, if it was boiled with soda ash for softening, um, how that would affect the, um, the color and other properties. Um, and I was living like very closely with all this stuff in my little house here. There it is just hanging in the middle of my house. Um, so here I'm spinning the fiber. Just all day. <laughs> And um, all of that to get some yarn. And like any fiber artist, once you have yarn, you want to dye it. So I did a few dye tests with, um, with onion skins and walnuts. Um, I mordanted the onion skins, one with um, aluminum acetate and sodium carbonate. And then the walnut, I did not mordant because walnuts have, have tannins and don't need a mordant. And you can really see like how well the fiber took the color, which was really special to me because in general, cellulose fibers don't saturate like protein fibers do in terms of taking dye. Um, so this is some of like the darkest color I've ever gotten on, on cellulose fibers. And I've been doing this like about six years. So middle picture, you can see um, the variation in just the natural hem. Um, the one laying across the top was washed with soda ash and that did change the color a little bit. And then on the left, we have the walnut. On the right, we have the onion. And then here are some of the things that I made just playing around with, um, with the yarn. Um, um, so just, a special thank you to my team, the extension team, Heather, 
um, Roger at Borderview, Travis, um, and everybody for um, just being here and listening. Laura, that was awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. You've worked so hard to um, bring all this together. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you both. It was really great to see the end products, Laura. That was cool. Um, so we do have one question in the chat currently. Um, and some feedback that they're saying awesome. <laughs> so Mary's wondering, she's trying to visualize yield. One of those stock bundles of hemp that you redded in a pool will make three ounces or 250 foot ball of hemp yarn. Fill in the blank with the amounts, please. I don't know. Do you have that information, Laura? Um, so one of those bundles did make roughly like um, the ball of yarn I was holding. I can go back to that slide if if need be, but it's just like a big handful of yarn. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but I should definitely be um, be weighing these things and and uh, figuring them out going forward. I was just gonna say, Laura, that made me think. Um, we we keep thinking about um, documenting the process that Laura's going through, taking you know the hemp from seed all the way to the materials and the products that she's making and what we want to capture along the way that would be meaningful uh, to folks like yourselves. And we just keep going through that process every time. And I, I think like Laura, appreciate that comment because yeah, like what, what <laughs> I'm thinking about some fiber that we're getting ready to send up to the Maritimes to have process. So it'd be really great to make sure we measure what we're sending and then we know what we got back um, and relate that back to yields in the field. So thanks for that question. Um, we want to thank everyone again for joining us. This has been a great first day of our 2022 Industrial Hemp Conference. 